Welcome back to the Discovering Commercial Real Estate Podcast. We are privileged to have leasing veterans Brandon Singer and Michael Cody here with us today. After graduating from George Washington University in 2007 with a degree in business administration, Brandon Singer began his career in commercial real estate brokerage. During the 16 year career, Brandon has negotiated high profile retail, hospitality, and food and beverage leases in New York City and gateway cities across the United States. Brandon's transactions for tenants like Showfields, Fit House, H&R Block and Fabric, as well as major landlords like the related companies, Blackstone, Thor Equities and Ashkenazi Acquisition Corporation have surpassed $4 billion in aggregate value. In late 2013, Michael Cody accepted what he originally believed would be a temporary support role in retail real estate to financially supplement his performing arts career. However, that short term gig led Mike to Michael developing an unexpected passion for retail and transitioning into brokerage. Michael then spent the next several years leasing flagship locations for trailblazing retail tenants and marketing retail opportunities for many of New York City's top commercial landlords. A graduate of Clarion University of Pennsylvania, Michael feels a special connection to young entrepreneurs, taking great pride in helping new tenants roll out their concepts in New York City. Singer and Cody have worked together for nearly eight years, and in September of 2020, the two decided to join forces and form their own leasing brokerage firm, Retail by Mona. Mona is a first of its kind retail leasing and advisory firm that uses modern tools to guide tenants and landlords through the increasingly disrupted retail landscape. An acronym that stands for making of a new age, Mona was inspired by the most famous image of the Renaissance period, as well as its founder's steadfast belief that retail has entered a Renaissance of its own. Brandon, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules to come on this podcast. Thanks it's for having greatly us. appreciated. Yeah, great to be here. So before we talk business, let tell the audience about a little bit about yourself. So where are you from and why did you get into the industry? Let's start with you, Michael. So I'm originally from a small town. It's about 20 miles outside of Pittsburgh uh, called Ambridge, Pennsylvania. It's like a little steel town, like right. one of the many Rust Belt towns that, you know, use the steel to build like all the bridges that we have here today, including the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, I li- bumped around the Midwest for a little while. I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio for about a decade. I lived in Chicago for about two years and I spent a little time in Minnesota. Uh, before winding up in New York City. Um, actually, just recently, I celebrated my 10-year anniversary, and I know that it's my 10-year anniversary nice. because I moved here right after Hurricane Sandy. Oh. So I'll never forget that ever. Um, that but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been in Queens the whole time. I, I, yeah, so 10 years here. I, I met my wife here. Um, I now have a wife and a stepdaughter. Um, and uh, before, you know, commercial real estate, I was working in performing arts. So like, Like my bio says, this was really just supposed to be a short-term gig, but it's turned into so much more and I couldn't be happier. Amazing. Amazing. Brandon, and you? Uh, Born and raised in uh, in New York on Long Island, a town by the name of Melville. Um, uh, um, I went to college um, in D.C., as you mentioned, at the George Washington University. I graduated in 2007 and came right into commercial real estate brokerage um, straight out of college within a couple of weeks of graduating. Um, I was 21 years old and I've been doing it ever since. And Amazing. Yeah, it's uh, been in New York the entire time. So that's great. Um, yeah, it's been, I'm on year 16 now. Wow, yeah, okay. Time flies. And if you had to think to your earliest sales experience, the first time you remember selling something, what would that be? What comes to mind? So um, I had an internship when I was in high school at a local um, Long Island based industrial real estate brokerage, industrial product, you know, warehouses and stuff, uh, focused uh, brokerage shop and the name is Shacker Realty, still in business now. Um, And um, a family friend of mine needed help with an office and I helped them find a small office on Long Island. I guess I was probably, I don't know, 18 years old, oh, wow. 17 years okay. old, uh, whatever the legal age is to be licensed as a broker. I had like just gotten my license yeah. and did it. Um, and um, yeah, that was my first deal as far as real estate, real estate transactions. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Michael and you? My first uh, real estate transaction that I worked on was actually at um, a Trump property that okay. was on uh, Central Park South. And um, I worked with this guy here and we leased it to Credit Manger. That was the first time I did anything in that. Very interesting. Yeah. And what do you think you guys would be doing career-wise, if not commercial real estate? I think I'd be doing something creative again. Uh, I don't exactly know what it would be. I don't mm-hmm. know whether I'd be writing 
or I would be an editor, hopefully for like a major publishing house, but right. it'd be something in that field. I'd be playing in the NBA. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'd be, uh, I'd be in the music industry. Great. And also playing in the NBA. Awesome. Right? <laughs> Winning championships. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, looking back, what's something you both did in high school and college that you think helped you beyond uh, down the line to, to excel in commercial real estate? So I used to produce um, events in high school and college that, you know, parties, events, they were um, concerts, they were, you know, nightclubs, what, 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 either or both. Um, and I had a, two business partners that I'm still dear friends with today. And, you know, we always talk about how it helped us learn how to be entrepreneurial right. and how to build a business and how to have responsibility and that things are going to go wrong, but how to plan. So I think those two things really prepared me um, for being able to get into such an entrepreneurial field, such 100%. as commercial, commercial real estate. estate. Um, and yeah, so that would be my answer. Okay. Yeah. And you, Michael? This is a weird answer, but so I was in the newspaper in both um, high school and in college and spending so much time proofreading your own work causes you to look for things and like try to find consistency within the stories that you're telling. Right. And so often when you're putting out, you know, we have a small shop, so we do, you know, have kind of our hands and everything. But growing. Like, yeah. Growing. Small but growing. Yeah. Small but it's going to take over soon. Uh, yeah. But, you know, everything from like press releases to, especially when you're putting out offers, you have to make sure that everything that you're putting out is consistent right. and that everything that people have sent back to you is consistent. Definitely. That's been extremely helpful. 100%. Yeah. That sounds very helpful. Um, what have been your most difficult deals that you guys have worked on in retail brokerage? And what have you learned from these experiences? Wow. There's uh, the <laughs> most difficult or yeah, the most difficult. Um, hmm. You know, the, the most difficult is not always the biggest, right. which is an interesting thing, right? And you learn as you are, as you evolve in your career that first off, you need to do them all. You need to work on the big ones, the medium ones, the small ones. Um, and it's because you're trying to service your client. Right. So today's small deal can turn into tomorrow's big deal, right? And you always have, you can't really look at it as a, um, you know, I just need to make a hit, make a bunch of money. Yeah. And that's not how you look at it as a broker. So interestingly enough, I think the most difficult deals we've ever worked on were probably, um, you know, without getting into the specifics and giving up like the client confidentiality yeah. side of things, I would say is probably, you know, in the midst of the beginning of COVID when we were still working, trying to make deals, obviously, you know, what was up is, was now down, what was left was now right. It was, it didn't make any sense. And tenants that were out there looking for space were, looking for these types of, you know, like the most tenant friendly deals that you ever heard of, like almost like they were being paid to go into the spaces, right. percentage rents only, no base rent, you know, and no one really knew, like that never really happened in that scale before, obviously percentage rent deals happen, but like it was, it was, it was so challenging. And, you know, I, I can remember, um, we were working on, and again, I don't want to give up the client confidentiality right. part of it, but we were working representing um, a tenant and we were out there looking for space and the tenant said to us, how can I pay rent? How can I guarantee I'm going to pay X amount of dollars in rent? Yep. I mean, and I, to be honest, I didn't blame them. Like the world was upside down. Yeah. There was nothing. So um, I would say that without giving, again, the specific of that, it would be something in that time frame. Right. And, um, you know, what did I learn from it? I learned, I think that was part of the question, right? What did yeah, I yeah. yeah. What did I learn from it was that, um, you know, you have as a, as a commercial real estate broker and someone that's clients put their trust in you, you know, so long as what they're asking for is not absurd and, yeah. and sometimes it is absurd, but is, and you have to have your client's best interest at hand and try to do the best job you can for them to get it done. 100%. No matter how, you know, upside down it may seem. That's your objective. So you have to do your best to put yourselves in, in yourself in their situation and kind of think of things and figure out a way to make it happen. Absolutely. Michael and you? Uh, I know exactly the deal you're talking about. And yeah, that was probably the most difficult one too. Right. Um, I would say what I learned from that one specifically, and I always try to tell like the younger brokers this, is just don't forget that, you know, even though your client has needs, to remind them that there's somebody else sitting on the other side of the table too. Right. And if a deal is tilted too far in our direction, it's just not going to happen, no matter no matter what. There, there's a famous like you know saying that a good negotiation means everybody leaves the table a little unhappy. Yeah, and that's that's true. That's how it went. Yeah, yeah. nice. Um, how has retail brokerage evolved as a more creative process in the past decade? So, I think the biggest thing is that forgetting retail brokerage, retail as a as a category has changed right. so much. Obviously. Right. 
you know, growing up, you'd go to a store. I remember you'd go to the, the, the store, there'd be inventory on the shelves. You, you wanted the, the large sweater or the pants. You'd go through the stack, it'd be small, medium, large. You pull it out, you try it, right? That still happens to some degree, but if they didn't have your size, they'd go downstairs or go in the back and they'd bring out, you know, five other pair, right? So obviously with technology and the internet and, you know, omni-channel strategies, you've seen retail evolve in a way that um, it's a lot smarter. Right. It's a lot more creative, meaning, you know, when the internet really became popular as a way to shop for e-commerce, um, a lot of the brands that were slow to adapt are gone now, Right. When was the last time you, you know, Sports Authority, gone. The Children's yeah. Place, gone. You know, so on and so forth. The list goes, list goes on. And in that time, so many new companies have evolved and come around to really understanding that it's not necessarily the store versus the internet. It's the store and the internet right. as one. And it doesn't matter where the sale is made as long as the sale is made, right? So because of that, I think you've seen a, a whole, you know, big like a major variety of new brands and new concepts that optimize that strategy of selling product um in addition to that i think today's day and age the the emergence of obviously social media and and the moment and the right. brand having the drop with the celebrity or the person it's it, you know look obviously back in the 80s and 90s it was michael jordan with air jordan that was like the first i think fit foray into how impactful someone or something could be endorsing a product and now it's that's how commerce yeah. works. That's how retail works now for the most part. So um, I think you've seen a, an emergence of marketing and uh, marketing and real estate are kind of all in one to how the creative way of retail has is in the present day. Definitely. So if, in order for companies to survive and thrive, they have to really change with the times and adapt to every situation in the market. Um, market. Yeah, I mean that's what it seems like. Yep. I mean I think you know if you're not if you're not thinking ahead, you're you're asleep at the wheel. And, and someone will come by and smoke you. And it's that simple in, in any industry. But I think specifically in retail, it changes so quickly. You know, um, it used to be seasonal. Remember there was like, you know, uh, fall, winter, spring, summer. Um, now it's like product drops once a week, right. once every two weeks. Yeah. And it's constantly evolving and changing. And things that were hot six months ago aren't hot anymore. 100%. And it's, you know, the, you, you, you see that in pretty much every category of retail. Great. And Michael, what do you think? I'm impressed by how many retailers are trying to do more with less in terms of uh, having like a smaller crew on hand. Right. Um, it sort of stinks because, you know, you're losing retail jobs and that's a good entry level job for people. But at the same time, if these companies are going to stick around, like I went to Uniqlo to buy some socks the other day and they have on the second floor, they've replaced most of their cashiers with essentially like a bin where you just drop everything in. And as you drop it into the bin, it just scans it instantly. Yeah. So you can drop in six things at once, scans everything perfectly. Yep. And I was out of there in I'd say a quarter of the time that it would have taken me wow. with cashiers there. And it was Smart. more efficient. It was better in every single way. Again, I feel bad because I don't want jobs to go away. I want people to be able to work, but right. it's impressive when you can give a better customer service experience with fewer people on the floor. Definitely, that's very interesting. Um, can you give us some, some examples of how you leveraged creativity and out of the box thinking to solve some of the problems that your clients have had? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the biggest example is starting Mona. Right. Um, you know, it's a creative approach on an industry, frankly, that has been stale. And I say that with respect to everyone, you know, I learned in that industry, but the way it was, has been, has been done has just not changed. Meaning, you know, a landlord hires a broker or an agent to put a space on the market to find a tenant. Right. The broker just like hangs a sign in the window and just waits for someone to call. Yeah. You know, there's other ways to communicate. Sending an email, yeah, definitely is good, but like there's newer, better, more advanced ways to communicate. So whether that's social media, text messaging, you know, creative ways on social, on social media, like we're doing now yeah. to get messaging out imagery, you know, different types of technologies to showcase spaces to different brands, um, is one way that I think creativity is, is something we pride ourselves on. Definitely. Um, and doing things just more cutting edge, more modern, more, you know, in a newer way. Um, and on the other side of the business with brands and companies, I mean, I, you know, I'm of the opinion that a lot of brokers and in, in traditionally, you know, Brokers get a bad name because yeah. they they typically don't really care about the client. It's like, oh, I'm going to make X amount of dollars putting this company in this space. 
figure it out. And then you see them all go out of business. All right, pre-COVID, which was obviously COVID, this happened too. But pre-COVID, if you walk the streets in New York City, there was vacancy everywhere. Every other store was vacant. And it was because the deals that were negotiated, the tenants couldn't make any money. Yeah. So the broker was the one who was responsible for that. Who's it, right? So what we do, what we do a little bit differently is on the other side of things, we have, we like to invest in brands. And we say to the founders, especially the newer brands, the more traditional institutional big companies that we work with, that's obviously not really on the table. But, yeah, yeah. you know, imagine it was 2012, 2013, and we took a piece of our commission like we do now, and we put it into Warby Parker. We put it into Casper, right? The founder thinks, you know, knows that we have a skin in the skin game. In the game we yeah. care. Like we, it's not like just, you know, figure it out, hope yeah. it goes well. It's like, all right, we're going to make a decision together and inform you on the decision that because we want to put our money where our mouth is. So that's a creative way of thinking. And I think on both sides, it's, it's uh, both landlord and tenant rep. It's something that we're seeing and is paying off pretty, pretty 100%. handsomely. Yeah. yeah. So Michael, what's your perspective on this? I really, I would second everything that Brandon says. He, he covered it extremely well. And one Perfect. thing I want to say too, is that, you know, talking about like the, you know, text messaging on our sign and things like that, people might see things like that and think like, oh, that's a gimmick. And on the surface, it might come off like that, but I, I can say for a fact, and <laughs> Brandon will do that, one of the largest deals that we've done as a company, and we really can't even talk about it because it's still kind of hush hush, right. came from one of the most powerful people in fashion texting, texting us off of one of our signs wow. and leasing our space. An extremely high profile deal. And, you know, it, no one else is doing that sort yeah. of thing. It really does work if you take these chances. Right. Everybody, I feel like everybody looks at something, looks down upon something until it works. Exactly. Once it works, then yes. people start to well flock said. to it. You know, Very true. So, absolutely. What does it take to be a billion dollar closer? <laughs> we'll tell you when I we get there. I, well, no, I, well, I can tell you what it takes to, I mean, how about a $4 billion closer? Right. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding, but no. Um, <laughs> it takes a lot of work, a lot of persistence. Um, you got to stay level headed. You got to stay, um, you know, there's a thick skin. You got to realize things are going to go up, things are going to go down. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have great days. The bad days sometimes, you know, they feel a lot worse yeah. than the good days feel good. And you just got to keep going. Um, and if you keep that mindset and you keep working hard and you get there early and you leave later and you're in the middle of your day, you're making more phone calls and doing more whatever is in front of you that you need right. to do. Um, you'll get there. It just takes time. And, you know, look, in today's day and age, I always say this, like, you know, a whole, gen like your generation, right? right. And like, you want to order food, you go on Seamless and you're right away. 20 minutes, it's yeah. there. You want yeah. to go somewhere, you call an Uber, yeah. right? You want to, whatever it is, it's instant. Commercial real estate is not that way. Residential yeah. real estate to some degree is, meaning you rent an apartment, it takes two days, right. sign the thing, you know. But commercial real estate, we work on deals that take 12 to 18 months, even longer sometimes. And when you're not making any money, especially in the beginning of your career, it's like, wait a minute, 12 to 18 months to yeah. make money, that's, that's insane. Yeah. And it is insane, but, I, but if you stick with it and you keep going, and even when you get knocked down, you keep going, you keep going, you coming, keep going, it's pretty simple. If you stay around the backboard, you're gonna get a rebound. Definitely. Right? So um, uh, that would be my advice as to sort of what it takes, just perseverance. The harder you work, the luckier you get. So you think there's a problem with delayed gratification with the new generation? They're more, they want things right away and they don't want to wait 12 to 18 months before they, you know, actually hit something. I feel like I sound time. really old <laughs> and like, like professorial saying No, but I'm that. saying like over, over time. But it's, but it's not their fault. It's not their, right. that's, it's, it's not, not their, their fault. fault. No, like, it's, it, right. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm, pro, I'm, I'm a millennial, right? right? Like I, I'm a product and the rest of my life, everything's so, you know, it's instant. Right. Anything you want to do happens overnight, right? Or not, quickly, right? So it's a weird thing to like shut that off and turn that on. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I think it's a generational problem mm -hmm. that, um, you know, for the for the for the person in the Gen Z or whatever is under, I don't even know what the next one is under Gen Z, but yeah. like <laughs> that next generation, those that can like really have that approach and mentality, I promise you it'll work because the, the competition is just going to be so much less than yeah. people that can stick it out. It's so, almost going to be non-existent yeah. competition. Definitely. Um, so boiling it down, what value does a retail broker provide between a deal between the landlord and the tenant? Education is the biggest thing. You need to educate your client on both sides to try and make a deal happen. You know, right. a landlord says, I want X amount of dollars. I want this type of uh, commitment, you know, and you got to say to the landlord, look, I agree. It's a great asset. Right. That's why we want it. That's why the tenant wants it. Right. But, you know, 
reality is the building next door to you or the building across the street, just there was a deal done at, you know, 20% less than what we're doing. We should take this deal. It's a good deal, right? right? And on the other hand, the tenant always wants to pay as little as possible, but you have to be able to educate them and justify, well, you know, look, I, I get it, right? I understand you want to keep your expenses low, but you should take this location because if you're going to pay this rent or something close to the rent, look at the sales you're going to do. Right. And look at the sales that everyone on the street is, is doing. Exactly. So it's an education um, and making sure that both parties are aware. Now, sometimes, you know, there's no educating and the landlord or the tenant says, this is it. And it's a matter of hold hand holding and trying to, you know, prepare, pr provide them with as much ammo to make their lives easier. Definitely. That's really what it comes down so to. So to be an advisor more than a broker. Correct. You're an advisor. You're helping right. both sides making their lives easy. They need something, you take care of it. You, you know, you want to put together documents, right? That's sort yeah, of how yeah. it works. So. 100%. Michael, what do you think? Calm, steady voice. That's it. Just, okay. I mean, sometimes it's like, you know, emotions are running so high that you just need to be the one to just like calm everybody down, right. apply a little bit of logic and say like, okay, you know, a, a lot of times the things that we say to people are just common sense, but like, you know, the motors are going so fast that they right. just need someone to be that voice and say what needs to be said. 100%. Yeah, definitely. Um, and how, how have you guys invested into tenants brands and kind of given, I've, I've listened that you guys have given a piece of the commission to the tenant, uh, the value of the piece of the commission, value, legally you okay. can't give a piece of the commission. Right, right. Yeah, so the value. value equal to a piece of the commission right. when it's earned to show skin in the game. Correct. So walk us through how you guys came up with this concept to me. I mean, a lot of brokers do it. Right. We're not, we're not like, I'm not like the Elon Musk of this right, idea. Right. It's like, it's obvious, right? The difference is organizationally. A lot, no brokers do it, yep. meaning Mona does it. It's almost like a VC kind of arm by Mona. It just makes sense to me. And you know, a lot of these commissions are significant. You know, we're talking six figure, seven figure commissions. Yeah, That's real money and a tenant, depending on who the tenant is, could use that money as far, you know, that's, that's, that's something they can, you know, you invest in and they want to know that you care. It's not just like, oh, I got rich off your deal. Hope it works out. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's still plenty of money to go around after you invest in it. And then hopefully it works. Yeah. Right. Hopefully the thing works. Then you forgetting that. I mean, from an, a business decision, if you believe in the concept, if the thing works, whether it's a restaurant or it's a, you know, some unicorn retail concept, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. Now, you know, this is probably a separate conversation. The VC model is sort of, you know, you put one out of a hundred hits. Right. Yeah. So, you have to learn that and you learn, trust me, you've le I've learned that the hard way on some yeah. stuff, but that's kind of the way, um, that's how we thought of it. So being more like partners than, than intermediary intermediaries, like, like investing, putting skin in the game, being a partner on the, on the vision of the entrepreneur. Correct. Okay, great. Um, and what are some of your unconventional ways to generate leads, whether that be tenants or landlords? I can't give you, I can't, I mean, I can't give you the sauce, bro. <laughs> Come on, what do you, I can't give you the sauce. Can you give us a taste of the sauce? Um, Great relationships. Okay. Networking with great relationships. Okay. Perfect. Not rocket science. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The one thing, you know, I'm seeing this guy, this guy's a relationship machine. Uh huh. And uh, that's one great bit of advice for young brokers is like meet as many people as you can. Right. Stay in touch with as many people as you can. Follow up with everybody. And just check in. Say right. hello. F follow up is the key. That's the whole business. If yep. you follow up and, and stay in front of people as a broker, I mean, you can't follow up and say stupid things. You got to know what you're talking about Obviously, and provide yeah. value. But like yeah. if you're following up with value and something that someone, that's the name of the game. Right. And have you, have you seen that a lot of your deals have came from situations where you not, didn't even necessarily think that you would be closing a deal. It's like a years later. Yeah. I met this person on, you know, on a vacation we stayed in touch. Right. This one knows that one, that one knows this one, this one we get years. Crazy how things work out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you find your niche within retail brokerage? Mm. It's a great question. Um, some brokers have specific niches that they, focus on, right. whether it's food, yep. hospitality, luxury, fitness, wellness, you name it, experiential. Yep. Personally, I'm of the opinion you should do it all. Um, you know, markets like anything else go up and down. So when luxury is hot, some other things are not hot. Right. When other things are hot, luxury is not hot, right? So you, as a broker who's eating what you kill, you need to have expertise in everything. Personally, that's my opinion. Um, but some some brokers just really like their skill set and what yeah. they do and there's nothing wrong with that i mean it's you know that's there there's people that are really 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 expert in certain fields you know we just brought on um one of our partners at mona mm -hmm. and the, and their team the best in the business as far as hospitality f and b her name's alex turboff and 
her two her two uh, partners are Marissa Simpkin and Jason Lloyd. Okay. Amazing, best in the business, and they know F and B and hospitality like better than anyone. So I give them a lot of credit, and it helps you know me feel comfortable that when we have a landlord or obviously a tenant that needs that advice, right. they're in good hands, right? So um, it just depends on. Um, sort of the feel. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm of the personally. I try to do it all. Yeah. But um, obviously, expertise develops and sort of you kind of gravitate to what you're interested 100%. in and what your clients are interested and in. And Michael, what do you think about that? I think sometimes it could be a little accidental too. Right. Like well you, said. you, you just wind up working on one weird deal. Yeah. And that no one else knows what to do with, and you kind of stumble your way through, and then like you get specific you do, knowledge. Yeah, exactly. You get specific knowledge. You stumble through a second deal, and right. then like, well. Unwittingly, you're that expert. In fact, one of the people that we're working with right now just did is working on two deals right now that are of like a really specific nature. And as soon as they're done, we're like, okay, you're the king of this thing. Right. And that's a great place to be. Hundred um, percent. And and what was the turning point where you kind of just woke up and you decided, you know what, I'm not going to work at a big shop like Cushman and Wakefield. I'm going to go off on my own. How did that How did that happen? Right. I'm manage my okay um what i'll say is this tremendous respect for cushman and wakefield taught me you know i was at another firm to start but i was there for right. a moment learn you know that's as that's as new york big time as it gets commercial cushman and, yeah. and commercial real estate Definitely. that's you know as good as it gets but um specific to retail which is what we do yeah. not office leasing not investment sales um and i have a lot of friends and colleagues that i still we do business with in the retail group i didn't see the big companies and embracing the future of retail the way they should be mm. what we just discussed right right um it wasn't like i woke up overnight and just said i'm out of here yeah this is a business plan that we put together over a long time yeah then COVID hit frankly it was an opportunity so you we said that you you said that would help that helped you more than it put you set you back COVID. i mean obviously nothing i mean there's opportunity things like that create opportunity Glass half full. right yeah. it's it, it, that's what you learn as right. you like it's a crazy terrible thing obviously right. but like those types of events whether it's that or an economic thing or right. both of those which was an economic thing right. or other events that happen in the world correlate and translate to opportunity definitely for people like us yeah for any business person there's you just got to Instead of looking down, look up. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And that's how you got to. And that's a tough thing. That's not a natural way to, you know, oh my God, the world's ending. You know, this virus spreading. Right. It's tough to be like, oh, let's try to figure out a way to optimize this. Not many people have that. Yeah. Frankly, it's something that I've learned as I've gotten a little bit more uh, entrenched in my career. Um, but, you know, with that said, I have, you know, Michael and I are, are co founders and partners, and, you know, and the rest of our team is amazing. And the people we partnered with to do this, are best in class right. and as great of a partner as you can ask for. Right. Um, and because of that, it's it's made um, a belief that we had that retail was changing actually turn into a reality. And right. you know, I'd, you see it around New York, the Monas are all over the place yeah, and the everywhere. deals we're working on are um, pretty significant and our market share continues to grow. Um, and I think it just proves that, what I said, not to go on a tangent, but it proves that when there is some sort of major crisis event, yeah, if you look at it through a different lens in an intelligent, focused manner, you will find an opportunity to capitalize on it. Definitely, yeah. And so, so basically, what happened was you saw a gap in the market, in the retail market, mm -hmm. and you decided to fill that gap with Mona. Correct. Okay, great. And Michael, what's your perspective on on that? Um, well, I mean, I could say too, like you know, it wasn't uh, when you work for like you know, an institutional firm like Cushman, mm -hmm. it wasn't like a completely easy decision to walk away. Yeah, I'm, well, for, for sure. Yeah, yeah. it was like, I mean, there was a we lot had a of good. back and forth. We had a good there, it was, yeah. it's an amazing place, it really yeah. is, yeah. yeah. It, it was great, I mean, there were even times when I was like, okay, maybe like a brand goes, like maybe I'll stay, and I thought about it and thought about it, and you know. What do you mean? Uh, until, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Bro, we'll talk later, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, the, it, uh, beyond the fact that like, I enjoy working with you so Excuse much, me, and right. like I wanted to keep that going, but it was also the fact that like, I kept on thinking about like, okay, what's the best way for, you know, based on everything we've learned over the last couple of years for us to service our clients best. Right. Like in what environment can we give our clients the best service, the most modern service? And it felt like striking on our own just made the most sense. 100%. And it's never, once we left, even in the worst days, it's never felt like a risk ever. So you've never regretted the decision? You've always kind never. of just looked forward and- Never. Great. I mean, look, when we launched, it was like, 
you know, COVID winter in New York, yeah. it was, it was bad. I mean, it was like, we'd leave the office, we'd come to work because, and we'd leave the office and be like, oh my God, yeah. like there's no one on the streets. Yeah. Like it's yeah. dark, it's cold. It's, there's nowhere to go eat. Tough time. It, it, I mean, it was like, it was like, like end of times type yeah. feeling. Yeah. You know, the streets and it was, it was crazy. So wearing masks in the office, you couldn't go yeah. anywhere and like, sit anywhere. It was horrible. It was horrible. Absolutely horrible. And we had a team of brokers that worked with us, not, you know, salespeople that we put together that, I mean, you can't blame people in the industry. Like who would want to be a commercial real estate broker in 2020 in New right. York City? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like so, it stinks the first year, even in the best times. And that was not the best times. <laughs> right. So yeah, it was tough, but we we had a steadfast belief in what we were doing. Again, we have great partners that believed in us and believed in the vision, and we kept going, and now it's paying off. Great, great, and, perfect. You know, by no means are we resting on that. We got a lot of work to do ahead yeah, of, of us. Yeah, of course. But at least, you know, you walk outside and you feel action. New York seems to be back. It's yeah, alive, definitely. you know? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, and let's say someone's watching this right now that just graduated college, and they want to be real estate entrepreneurs like yourselves. Would you recommend that they go to a big shop like Cushman and Wakefield, get a couple of years of experience under their belt, or start directly in, in entrepreneurship? Start their own firm right away. They got it. Well, I, you cannot start your own firm right no. away. You got to, I mean, honestly, like, you need to learn. Right. And that doesn't mean you got to go to the biggest shop in the world. You can learn at our shop. You can learn at a big shop. You can, right? But, but you, no, you, as to, specific to being a commercial real estate professional, no matter what it is you do, you, you have to be to under learn, someone else's You wing. learn by doing. Yep. Right? Um, that's my opinion. And like make your mistakes in like an environment where somebody else can look over your shoulder and go like, no, you did that wrong, that wrong, that right. wrong. You did this right, this right, right, this right. And correct as you go rather than just making mistakes, blowing deals and right. hurting everybody. Because they've been in yourself. the same position that that person has been in and they, they can kind of walk you through it and make things process, make the process easier. Exactly. How do you go about setting goals for yourselves and for Mona? You want to go first? You want me to? Hmm. Um, personally, like I like to sit down every couple of weeks or so and like just journal and like take lists of like everything that I need to do in my personal life. And like, right. you know, I kind of break down my life into different segments and I go through every single one of them and say like, this is what I have worked on. This is what I've accomplished. This is what I need to work on. Um, Mona, it's just kind of like, it's, it's kind of a different version of the same thing. There's like a, like a daily to-do list and then there's like a next three months kind of right. list. And Brandon, you? I always try to do better than I did the day before. I've been doing that for 16 years. And I'm a huge, like I said, if I didn't, wasn't a broker, I'd be playing in the NBA. Right. <laughs> um, the reason I bring that up again is because, you know, when you look at the best, I'm a die, die hard basketball fan. Right. I'm, I'm biggest NBA fan maybe there is, uh, one of. And when you look at the top players and the top year on year, the people that are there, you know, they're in the gym putting up shots early yeah. and late. After the game, they're working out and continuing to put up shots, right? Like, if you apply that mentality to our profession, obviously you're not putting up shots. There's no game. There's right. no, unfortunately, $200 million contracts yet. Yeah. Maybe soon. Um, but if you apply that mentality and are able to, you know, work harder than the next guy, work smarter than the next guy, be there earlier, leave later, right. make sure you're optimizing your time. Um, if you have that approach and continue to set goals that, okay, I did a great job, I just closed the big deal, now what? Yeah. Deal's done, now what do I do? Yeah, I got money coming in, great, but like, okay, now I gotta keep going. Yeah. If you always try to level up a little bit, and I know that's like corny and cliche, and like, but it's, but it, but like it's true, it's true yeah. you know? Um, and that's how I approach it. So every and, day to be a little bit better than the day before. Yeah, perfect. And what do you look for in a new hire? Is it that kind of mindset where you first one in, last one out? So it's very, very hard to find people, especially in today's day and age, that are able to operate like that. Right. And if you find that person, if I find that person, um, that is in that shoe in the in those shoes and yeah. has those qualities graduating college or graduating grad school um like call me like let's get let's like let's you come work with us like right. like we you know we have a great and excellent team of people and they're awesome and they really are and you know they are, the ages range from you know 22 23 to 
late, late 30s late 30s to yeah. late 40s even mm -hmm. i'm 36 he's like 60 and you know <laughs> how old are you 43 <laughs> uh, right and like uh and um no but we have a you know in the ages range to you know the mid to late 40s and um I can tell you that we were very lucky. Right. We had some, to be honest with you, some people that started when we started that, you know, didn't really have that and no disrespect to anyone. I wish them all well and hope right. that they're successful in whatever they do. There's a lot of things I couldn't do, right? Like I, trust me, plenty. But what's, I think, you know, been instrumental to my success personally is just working harder. Showing up every Earlier, day. Earlier, later, showing up every day. My friends make fun of me. You know, Brandon, like, take a vacation. Nah, I'm right. gonna work. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, nah, I gotta work. Yeah. You know, and like, that's just, it's ingrained in me. And frankly, the woman, the lady that Michael and I worked for at Cushman for a long time ingrained that for sure in me. That, you know, and that's what it takes to be successful. You really need to just work harder. Definitely. Yeah. 100%. And she was one of the most successful brokers ever in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And Michael, what do you think about um, what, What's the what's your been perspective on hiring new people? How, how have you seen that the generation has shifted over the past 20 years, 30 years? Um, I mean, so this is like really the first time in my career that I've been in a position when I've been hiring. So I don't have much to compare it to previously. Right. But I do believe that, yeah, people want a good work life balance. Yeah. And I, I completely respect that and appreciate it. However, this is like commission based eat what you kill job. Yeah. And I think sometimes people walk in thinking that you're going to get that same sort of work life balance that you get in like just a straight salary job for like a, you know, and it's the same any firm that you go to, whether you go to like a small firm or a major firm. Um, that's been the hardest thing. It's like people willing to put in those hours. But you know, like Brandon said, like if you put it in the time, and it's you give work. it time, it's going to be successful. You're going to yeah. make so much money and you're going to be very happy. And the one other thing that is, is super important to stress that with what we said about working hard, the biggest thing, and again, this is cliche, but it's true, is you need to have honesty. Yeah, You need to be honest in everything you do. Because in this kind of business, there's big dollars, there's big money out there. And it's sometimes, you know, human nature, like, eh, if I do like this a little, right. no. cut the corner a little bit, whatever that's a short-term way of looking at things and could you make a bunch of money that way no doubt not the right way to do business and it will bite you in the ass whatever you know whatever's done in the dark will come to the light kind of thing definitely um without question you always are honest and sometimes that means not having the answer and not and not knowing and yeah. or doing something i screwed up you know honesty and hard work will create success Perfect. In this business. That's definitely something that people can and I mean get that, and, and I'm not saying that just to be like, oh, I'll be honest. No, you know, yeah, like yeah. it's true. It's not like yeah. your parents teaching, oh, always tell the truth. Like it's really you need to be honest in this business. Right. Hundred percent. Not it'll bite you in the ass. And what do you think the learning curve is in commercial brokerage? What what would you estimate to be the length of time before a broker really gets it and is able to originate and close their own deals? <sighs> I always tell people you're not going to make a dime for two to three years. Now, hopefully that happens sooner. I mean, right. I'll, I'll I'll say something that I'm very proud of. Um, every single person that's been with us that stuck with it for 12 to 24 months, mm -hmm. every single person is now making six figures right. at Mona. I mean, that's great, yeah. which is great. Yeah. That's not the case yeah. everywhere. Hopefully we continue that. And the more right. people that come on, that's just sort of our model. And I want to optimize the people that to help them grow. But again, that's not like, oh, I'll show up to work. I'm going to show up at, you know, and I'm going to work from home three days a week. And yeah. here I'm going to make a hundred grand. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying if you put in all the recipes to success that we're saying, that's, that's, that's the output. Is it guaranteed? No. Is, can some crazy new virus come about and shut the whole world down again? Then you got nothing. Yeah. But guess what? If you have a salary job, guess what's going to happen to you? Same thing. Yeah. yeah you're, you're done. Yeah. Right. So like the way I always saw it was there's a lot of comfort in a salary. But like, I'd rather at least take a, take a risk and try to make exactly. more than that, right? Yeah. So, hundred yeah. percent. And do you think a broker should start out analyzing deals and then moving into origination, or start directly in origination? Depends who they are. Depends where they're from. Depends who they are. Depends on their skill set. Right. You know, it's a it's like a let's delicate, say it's a blank slate. Let's say it's someone who doesn't know anything about commercial real estate. Then you should start in working as an analyst for somebody. Right, because you can go originate, but if you know what you don't know what you're doing, then like right, hundred percent. Oh, I can get business, and then you're gonna fail. Yeah, and that's not good. Or you're gonna need you know somebody who's like on our level or higher to like you know be there Walk with you, through. holding your hand every step of the way. And frankly, you're gonna have to give that person most of the money you're bringing in anyway. Right. So, right. definitely. 
Okay. Very interesting. And, um, what are some of the most effective strategies you guys have utilized to learn the language of commercial real estate? Time, patience and time and listening. Listen, listen, listen. I, I mean, I still go to meetings, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, we're, we're brokers and we, uh, we, we, you know, most of the stuff we get obviously, but there are, there are still things where I'm in a meeting with, you know, an investor right. or an owner or, a, you know, a private equity firm on the tenant side. And there's things that I'm like, what, what, is it, what, what does that mean? Yeah. You gotta ask questions, you gotta listen. There's no dumb questions. And anyone that makes you feel like you're asking a dumb question is not someone you wanna be doing business Definitely. with. Definitely, yeah. Now there are dumb questions if you're at a point in your career and you ask something stupid, yeah. that's not right. But what I mean is if you know, people out. that are inquisitive and ask questions and wanna learn, there's an appreciation for that. And that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about commercial real estate is there's like a, there is a, um, a like, unspoken code of wanting to help the next generation right. right you know definitely and people that are in the business always kind of want to help other people learn um and appreciate the work that they put in one of my favorite stories is i was like 23 or 24 and i was representing related on the caledonia which is a building on okay yeah uh, they, it was like a brand new building yeah. at the time and um we leased one of the spaces to a florist small little deal. And I was at dinner in Columbus Circle and I saw Steve Ross just like walking oh, wow. by. Okay. You know, he owns the the, yeah. the Time Warner, whatever it was it's called now, but at the time yeah. AOL Time Warner. And I was like, wow, like I, I gotta go say hi. Like I gotta say hi. Like, you know, so I met Mr. Ross, wait, wait, excuse me. He's waiting for the elevator. I said, yeah. I just want to introduce myself. I'm a broker. I'm representing related on the Caledonia. And when I tell you this guy was like Super perceptive. So, like went out of his way to be nice to me. And like, like wow. so was so appreciative of that. Like that kind of mentality, something that always, I will never forget that. And right. because of that, it's something that I try to, not that I'm at his level yet, but hopefully one day yeah. that I, when people come up to me and you know, uh, it's like, you gotta be friendly and talk to everyone and be nice 100%. and courteous. And that, that goes a really long way. So definitely. Yeah. Michael, what's your perspective on that? Uh, what was the question again? I kind of got it lost. It was, <laughs> What's your, what's your most effective ways to learn the language of the business of commercial real estate? Oh yeah, well, um, read all the publications that you can. Totally. Um, talk to everybody yep. and you know, like Brandon was saying, like, you know, ask questions. Right. What I used to do in meetings is like, anytime somebody would say a word that I'd never heard before, I would just like kind of like write it down really discreetly and then I would go and Google it later right. or ask him or ask somebody else who was senior. Um, and that went a long way. And I'm still doing that to this day. Like I, I'm writing down words in not as many meetings now, but there's still at least, you know, one or two meetings a week where I write something down. Always something you can learn. Always. Great. And what is the secret to effective negotiation? Listening, creativity, understanding the objective of your client and in your side of the table, but also understanding, you may not agree with it, but understanding the objective of the other side right. and trying to think of ways to bridge the gap and in a creative manner. And again, a good negotiation, they always say everyone walks away feeling a little Unhappy. like they left a little something on the table. Yeah. But if both sides feel that way, then chances are that's a good, that's a good, you don't want one side feeling like they got like right. ran over and the other guy feeling like, oh, I stole it. It just, that happens of course. But I think a good no fair negotiation is both sides walking away feeling like they got most of what they wanted, but left a little on the table. So would you say a good new negotiator can quickly understand yes. what the other side wants? You gotta listen to what the other side is saying. Right. And if you're listening to what the other side is saying and being able to think, all right, like this guy's nuts. He's never going to make a deal. Do you know what to give them? Like, or, you know what? I think I can take what, right. what he said. Let me, let me talk to my guy and see what we can do. Yeah. And if you have a good other, you know, opposing broker on the other side, typically that's how it works. Great. Michael, what's your perspective? Context is king. No uh, question. Anything, well said. Anything that you ever asked for, uh, let's say you make an aggressive ask, like I, I want $300 a foot and tenant improvement allowance. Right. Then when you go to it, you have to be able to say like, well, the reason we want this, it, it's not just like, because we're pigs and this is what we want you to give us. Like, no, we needed to do this and we need to do this and do, to do this. And then you can explain it and then they can go like, all right, that's reasonable or mm, still doesn't work for us. Mm, got it. Context matters so much. Definitely. Um, and how do you vet business partners? What's, what's a telltale sign that you shouldn't work with someone? So... Loyalty, honesty, being reasonable, um, understanding that 
that other person or the other your client knows that you're putting your best foot forward right. if you are yeah if you're not you deserve to be let fired and yeah. right but if yeah. you're working hard and doing the right thing and being honest and putting your best foot forward to advise and get someone the best deal as possible then on the other side of the table you should feel that mutual trust that you right. know that person's loyal to you you know sometimes i get calls from people that want us to represent them and they don't always they, they say yeah you know i'm not gonna you're not my like exclusive broker I, not for me yeah no interest does it, it's just not how we do business we, we put too much into our clients and we deliver results yeah. that it should behoove them to work with us exclusively 100%. so it's, it's hard enough even when you have an exclusive <coughs> relationship with somebody it doesn't uh, you're not doing yourself any favors by entering something that's not exclusive yeah or you know with a partner it's not going to treat you with respect um ask around if you don't know somebody talk to your friends talk to your colleagues see what that uh, partner's reputation is in the industry and usually if you talk to three people you're going to get a pretty accurate uh, yeah, depiction read, of who yeah. someone is 100 percent. and um how do you maintain good relationships with other brokerages and other firms to encourage future business? You gotta stay friends with everyone. These are my friends. These are people I've been in right. the business with for almost 20 years now, right? And these are people that I have social relationships with. We go to right. dinners, travel. Some of my closest friends are people in the industry. Right. What happens? You know, these are who you're in the weeds with every day. Um, and you know, sometimes the opposite happens where you get into a thing with someone, you know, look, the one thing I, 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 I never really understood or liked, but it's part of any type of sales role is like the, the hater jealousy mentality right. that goes into an industry where you hear, you know, someone guy made a lot of money or some yeah. lady made a lot of money. And all of a sudden you hear X, Y, and Z talking, you know, smack, ah, oh, they got lucky. This, yeah. that. Like, I hate that. Yeah. Like get your money. There's enough to go around. Right. Like, so if you embrace that, like. That's how I'm. That's how I put what I put out, and hopefully those that I associate with put it back, and that's yeah, it. Definitely. Yeah, Michael, what do you think? Yeah, just just remember it's a long game. Just remember you're going to yeah. be doing deals with these people for you know like five years, yeah. twenty five years, and uh, you know don't don't do anything that you wouldn't do to somebody that you're planning to see for the next twenty five years. Exactly. Yeah, of course, it's a long game. Yeah, you got to treat people with respect and honesty. Great. And in what situations in business? Do you listen to your gut and intuition more than you would listen and listen to logic and reasoning? All of them. You think it started out other way around where you, you would do logic? Always trust your gut. Okay. Now your gut may, you may not know something and therefore your gut will get nerve, you know, make you nervous. Right. That's different. But if you're, if you're, if you're fully in the know on something and you understand something, trust your gut always. You know what to look at the numbers. The numbers can convince your gut to feel differently. Right. Like if you read the numbers, you're like, oh, okay, then yeah, then like <laughs> they go right. with the numbers. But but if they don't, and if you're still saying like, uh, this isn't working out, then yeah. I'll give you an example. We're in the middle of something right now with potential litigation. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are saying, sue this, sue him. This yeah. guy did the wrong thing. We literally, were with, we were talking about this yesterday with a lawyer. But our gut says, you know what? It's just not worth it. Right. And for all you who's watching, you know, when it's time to sue, we will we'll take legal action. That's not what I'm saying, yeah. but the you know the cow, it's just your gut tells you to just not do it. Life's too short. It's just not worth it in this one specific instance. But the numbers, you'd be like, you should sue, right? And that's an example that literally happened yesterday. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Okay, yeah. um, and who were your role models and people you looked up to when you guys were coming up in the industry? Um, it's a great question. There are a lot. I mean, it depends on. You know, I'm a student of the game. I grew up, my father's in real estate. He kind of put me onto the game back when he, he had to leave the business when he was in his like mid to late 20s, he went into the family business, long story. But I always knew about like Eddie Gordon, right. ESG, which is now CBRE. Um, I knew about the Peters brothers, the Cushman and Wakefield. These are people that, you know, my, we had relationships with that would, you know, these are like, you know, old school New York legends, icons, right? In today's right. day and age, you know, the Marianne Ties of the world and Steve Siegel's of the world. And, you know, these are office brokers for the moment. Adam Spees, who's my, like a mentor to me. Yeah. Like these are guys that are Doug Harmon, like next level type of people. Those are the people I look up to and I try to emulate. You know, I worked for RKF, which doesn't exist anymore. Robert Futterman, that guy was the man. Like yeah. he was the biggest and he's not in the business anymore really. But the point is, is that, if you have respect, it's a great question because if you have respect and know where you, you're, what you're coming from and who was before you, right. 
it'll let you, I think, pave the way to hopefully getting to that Definitely. level one day 100%. So in the future. Michael, what about you? There's a, there's a burger I always really looked up to, um, even though he wasn't a retail broker, is uh, Robert Ballard, who's okay. an office broker. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Broker, Mr. Ballard was like a uh, much very, very older man, uh, probably in his late 70s or 80s or so when I first met him. And uh, I'm not even sure if he's still in the industry or not, but it was just the fact that like he loved working in real estate. He loved it so much. And he'd just come into work every single day. He could have been retired long ago, but right. he loved it so much. I've seen him just be like, this brings this guy so much joy to come in here. And he's such a pleasure. And his attitude is so positive that uh, I, I was just always thought like, yeah, I could be like that. That's great. That's amazing. Um, and what's one lesson you've learned about yourself since you closed your first deal? Um, I've learned that and this is something, you know, that it's been a minute, but what I learned was that um, how to teach yourself how to stay level-headed. Mm. And like sure. I said before, sometimes it's easier to react a certain way, yeah. try to go for the short-sighted dollars as opposed to the long-term way. Yeah, Those are the things that I've learned over the years. And you learn by doing. Like, that's what I said, you got to learn by doing. 100%. Michael? I learned that uh, patience is a very underrated virtue. <coughs> that's for and sure. it's so important, especially in this Wow, very interesting. And um, what's more important for success in brokerage? Is it talent or consistency? It's a great question. Um, what's more, I don't think either, I think they're both equally important. Mm -hmm. And it's just consistency in the work you put in. And if you're talented and you work hard and you have a brain on some sort of a brain and right. the ambition, the luckier, you, the harder you work, the luckier you get. It's as true as it, as true of a saying that exists. Right. I don't, yeah, I agree that like you can't really have success without both, but I do think that of the two, if you can only have one, consistency. If you're there every single day, you know, you're going to make more of yourself than if you're a talented person who just screws around and doesn't put in the work. Putting in right. shots, putting up shots, shot, shots, you need yeah. the shots. Great. Put 100%. up those shots, that's how you get better at shooting. And are there any impactful books that have transformed your ways of thinking that you guys can recommend? Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> I don't. I, I haven't really read a book. I don't really. I read a lot of right, right. Uh, like news and I don't. I should read more books, but so I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. Yeah. I uh, I finally caved a couple years ago and read The Power Broker, and man, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, it kind of killed reading for me because it's like 1,200 pages, right. and they're all like you know super thin, tiny print. But if you want to learn about real estate in New York City and just the history of New York City and all of our roads and parks and like why the city is the way that it is. It's one of the best books I've ever read. And you should, everyone should, everyone who lives in New York City should read it at some point. I'll definitely check that one out. Um, let's say someone just graduated high school and is watching this right now and wants to become a retail broker like yourselves. What soft skills and what hard skills should they work on to make that vision a reality? I would say that first off, if they want to specifically be a retail broker, learn retail. Obviously, earn, learn what yeah. works and what doesn't. Yeah. Learn what brands are. Learn who goes where, who goes next to one another. Co-tenancy, understanding streets, right. malls, streetscape, shopping centers. How come you know Louis Vuitton wants to be next to Prada? Yeah. When I started, I was like, I don't get it. Why would you want to be next to your competitor? Exactly. But you then learn it's because it's the same shopper, yeah. right? Um, learn what makes a street work. Why, you know, what makes one neighborhood better than the other? Proximity to public transportation. Looking up to density and 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 you know understanding that there's a critical mass yeah. a mass and the reason that new york city has the value that it has is because there's so many people just look up yeah they only things to do shop eat get their hair cut dry cleaning so on mm -hmm. and so forth right so understanding that and then networking those two things if you can understand it and meet people and meet the right people um that will enable you to hit the ground running when if and when you go to college and if and when you graduate college and right. get to get to the the business 100 percent. yeah uh Focus on setting yourself deadlines okay. and uh, setting yourself, you know, like lists of things that you need to accomplish. Right. And um, yeah, just following through with people and following up with people. Do you think it's important to set a hard date on something? Because if you just have it in your list and it's not, doesn't have a date attached to it, you kind of just put it off further along down the line? Yeah, there, there's that saying. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it's like, you know, the amount of work that you have will automatically take up the amount of time that you have exactly. to do it in. Yeah. So if you give yourself like, you know, I've got three weeks to do this. No, give yourself a week. Right. And like practice on little things, right. you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to go 
drop off my dry cleaning in the next five days or something like that or on this date. And then like once you get used to like sticking to a schedule in like your personal life, it's going to get way easier and sticking to it in your business life. And like your life, your business life is going to be so regimented that you have to stick to a schedule. Okay. Very interesting. And um, what value can a young professional provide for you to make you want to either hire them or give them advice or whatever it is, help them out? They, I mean, is if they want to work with us, so they, work with you, or just ask for your perspective on the industry, ask for your advice. That's that's the world's round. You got to pay that forward. So I'm happy to talk to anyone that needs okay, advice. Great. They don't need to provide any value for me. Great, you know. But as far as working with us, mm-hmm. they need to provide value for us. <laughs> they need to make our lives easier in some ways, help us, but we also teach them. So it's it's a symbiotic kind of thing. How would you recommend a young professional find find out? how to help a firm that they want to work for? Just reach out. In today's day and age, anyone's accessible. Right. Now, they may not read the message, right. they may not have the best attitude and get back to you, but reach out, send a note, send a LinkedIn message, DM them, right. You know, send a Facebook message, whatever you got to do to get at them, send them an email, look at their, like, there's enough ways to contact somebody yeah. that you can figure it out yeah. in today's day and age. Find a way, for sure. And as far as the value that you can provide too, you know, like we, we always sit with people who are brand new and say like, okay, Let's make a list of all of your contacts. Who do you know that works in each one of these industries? Like mm-hmm. they can turn into tenants. Maybe they've got a backdoor connection to a landlord. Definitely. That helps us. And also too, for younger brokers, like, you know, like I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a sprightly 43, but I don't know what 20 year olds are doing right now. I, I guess I do, but I learned it by the time it's already uncool. Right. So if they can come in and say what brands they love, like what are the brands that like, you know, kids in high school are really into. Right. Um, where do they like to go? Where do they like to hang out? What are the cool neighborhoods? Like, this is all extremely useful information that we might not get. And as time goes on, we're definitely going to be more detached from. 100%. And offer that kind of like unique perspective on certain things that you may not have access to. Exactly. Right. Okay. And also Great. too, you have to like shopping. You have to like retail. That, right. That's something I've had people ask us for jobs and it's clear like, you don't shop, you don't go anywhere. You right. go to your apartment and then you go to work and that's it. So th- that to me is a waste of your time if you're looking for a job in this industry, if you don't like retail. <laughs> right. You'd be shocked at how many people still want to work in it though. I don't get it. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, and what trends are you excited about uh, with the retail industry? How do you see new technology and Web3 influencing the direction of retail in the next decade? Um, put it this way. I have Meta by Mona on, on Instagram. Okay, okay. Great. <laughs> put it that way. Um, the reason I say that is because, look, I don't, no, obviously, um, but my gut tells me right. that what you will see is a world aside from retail that is completely connected virtually in the same way it's connected in reality, right. which is terrifying, but it's gonna be the way that it is. You're starting to even see it a little bit already. Easy, yeah. you, can, you can pick up on yeah. it. Just little things are happening that you know would suggest that. So when it comes to retail, I mean, you already have you know the, the, the cryptocurrencies as a way of um, buying product, right? As brands taking them, right? You know, those type, we represent a company by the name of Solana. Uh, okay. We did a deal for a big flagship deal for yeah. them in Miami. Like you're starting to see that the very, very, very beginning stages of that. And I don't think it's going to be that long given how fast things move mm-hmm. where you can, you know, be on social media and see, you know, the hat that, uh, name a celebrity is wearing and I want that hat right. and all of a sudden you buy it with your with your cryptocurrency yeah. and the thing shows up in reality at your door or in, or not it just shows up on your head in the virtual world yeah and I think there will be major implications for every type of retail whether it's shopping whether it's you know uh, restaurants and eating you know going to a restaurant with you, you can be in your, your apartment in Kansas and yeah. I can be in my house in Hawaii yeah. and we can have a meal, a meal together. And there will, be a, there will be, I don't know if you want to call that fake estate because <laughs> you know, real, real estate's yeah. in the real world, yeah. right? but like there will be, I guess, conceivably a broker that helps find a brand space in, the, in this whole virtual world, I guess. I mean, and maybe they correlate with the real world. I don't know, yep. but I see it coming down. It's coming at us and it's coming at us quick. So you don't necessarily know how it's going to play out, but you know that there's potential there and there's definitely without, something it's, there. Without a hundred million percent, Great. it's happening. Great. Michael, what do you think about that? I, I think it's going to be a lot of like subtle little innovations over mm-hmm. the next couple of years. I, I think, uh, I don't know as much about Web3 as I'd like to. Um, 
I, I think it's ultimately going to be a game changer, but it's not going to be right away. It's going right. to take a Correct. while for everything to trickle through. And then it's going to be one of those things that's going to be like little, 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 and then there's going to be some big technological leap, and then it's going right. to be like everything all at once. Right. So in 10 years, everything could look completely different, but for the next six years, it's going to look exactly the same. Right. That's very interesting. That's great. Um, so you've recently closed on a lease on the Upper East Side um, where you represented both the landlord, RFR Realty, and the tenant, Cool Spa. Um, this term, Medtail, walk us through what that means and how this medical retail trend will play out in the next few years in New York City and gateway cities across the US. It's about one word and one word only, wellness. Mm. And I think that what you see with fitness craze and the gyms in this pre-COVID, all the gyms expanding and looking for space all over right. the place, it's just an evolution and a continuation of that. And now you're getting companies that are looking into help others wellness, whether that's a doctor or a dentist right. or you know some sort of plastic surgery, whatever it is, you know, there's a whole host of companies that are looking to do it and it's all about wellness. Great. Yeah, I think we uh, got to wrap, but. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah. sounds good. Uh, no shit. So yeah. Yeah. thank you so much, Michael and Brandon for coming on this podcast. This has been great. Thank and you for I'm, having me. Yes, thanks, thanks for so having us. Of you course, know. and I'm sure that young professionals watching this will get some value from this and apply it to the careers moving forward. Hope so. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That was great.